Shabbat Shalom. So today we continue with our series that we're titling Sukkot Core because we're talking about the core values of Sukkot Shalom. And uh, I want to share with you a little bit of uh, my understanding and my process uh, in, in arriving at these core values. Uh, <clears throat> I've been working on these core values since 2011, so it's been a few years, and I've tried them actually in practice in three different congregations, so this is number four. So this is just to tell you that I, the, I didn't copy and paste this from the internet. <laughs> um, these uh, are my personal core values that I have thought about and, and researched scripture about and, um, and arrive at this and again tried through actual ministry processes. A core value though is simply a deep uh, seated belief. Most times, your core values are not, uh, you're not aware of them. Uh, so you may have been in, 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 in places, in congregations, and even families, where they will say, well, we believe this, but the practice says otherwise, right? Well, these, these are what we call aspirational values. Like, we would like to be this way, uh, not realizing that we're not that. <laughs> we understand that's what you should be, but for some reason, we haven't arrived at practicing the way that we want to. Uh, and so through that process, I, I, I work hard at Expressing it in expressing our core values in ways that are actually attainable. And today we're going to see one of the core values. You can you can actually go to our website, sukatshalom.us. We have all of our core values there, uh, and then we also have them more break, uh, broken down into more details. But these are the principles that guide everything that we do. So these are the whys behind the what it is that we do. So today I wanted to talk about one of these uh, core values. Is uh, The way we phrase it is that we hear God and minister prophetically. We hear God and minister prophetically. That's one of our core values. That we're all about hearing God. We hear God for ourselves, but we also hear God for one another. So we minister prophetically to each other. Um, so I want to talk today about what this means, what does it look like in the practice, and how we do it. Now, for the sake of clarity, I want to start out by uh, putting forth a, a definition of what actually is the prophetic. So for that, we're going to go to 1 Corinthians 14. And beginning with uh, verse 1, we know the passage, we know the section of the book of 1 Corinthians, and we're actually familiar with the book of 1 Corinthians, and the whole context in which this, is, this corrective teaching from Rabbi Shaul, or the Apostle Paul, uh, that he is giving. So in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1, he says, Pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. So we know the importance of love in Scripture, in our lives, in our fellowship. But look where he places uh, prophetic ministry. Very high. You know, earnestly desire. That's very strong language. Earnestly desire spiritual gift, and out of all the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Verse 2, he explains, For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, 
for no one understands, but in his spirit, he speaks mysteries. We talked about that in a series um, uh, maybe two, three months ago. Verse 3, but one who prophesies speaks to men for edification and exhortation and consolation. So that is a concise, workable definition of what the prophetic is. So it is speaking to people for all these three reasons, for edification, for exhortation, and consolation. We're going to break these words down in a moment. Verse 4, one who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but one who prophesies edifies the congregation. Now, remember, we talked about this, and we said this isn't actually like a, like a selfish versus unselfish thing. No, I need to be edified so that I can then edify others. So there is a proper place for speaking in tongues, particularly here in private for my personal edification. That actually needs to take place so that I can then edify others. Uh, verse 5. Now, I wish that, all, that you all spoke in tongues. That's a statement from Paul that we can't we can deny. I wish that you, every one of you, spoke in tongues. But even more, even more that you would prophesy. And greater is one who prophesies than one who speaks in tongues unless he interprets so that the congregation may receive edifying, implying that when you have the interpretation of tongues, that actually is also prophetic ministry because you are edifying the body. So, so the question then is, what is the prophetic? Well, simply put, it is to hear from God for others. That's, that's just what it is. To hear from the Lord for other people. I hear, from, I hear from the Lord for myself. I keep a journal of it. After so many years of watching my wife uh, keep a journal of the words that she would receive from the Lord, she had dozens of dreams that she has recorded and she can go to and search it out and, and, and steward what the Lord has spoken to her, I finally was convinced. You know, I was the typical guy. I'm not going to write it down. I'm going to remember it. And I never did. <laughs> and I've told you the story here before that uh, one time I was, I was actually preparing to teach exactly on this, on how to steward the words that you receive from the Lord. And that morning, uh, I, I, you know, I, I was finishing up my studying and my preparation and, and I wonder, you know, what did the Lord say to me a year ago this day? And so I was actually able because I was, I had already started to keep track of it and write it down. I was able to go back and, you know, I, I don't do it exactly every day. So I went back and it was the day before a year ago. Right? And it was amazing that the Lord has spoken to me out of the same passage. You can't make that up. It was exactly the same passage. I wouldn't have remembered. I didn't remember, actually. But it was actually the same passage. Just a year in difference. So I was actually able to use that as an illustration in my teaching that this stuff works. When you steward the words of the Lord, you, you can actually, he can, he can use it in your life again and again. All right, so the prophetic is to receive from God, to hear from God for other people. But I have two caveats here. Number one, you have to deliver it the way that he wants you to. And here's where it gets kind of crazy. <laughs> because... We've all seen weird people moving in the spirit, right? <laughs> or delivering it in ways that are, that are really um, kind of not the best. Peculiar, right? Not the best. The other one is that we need to deliver it without interpreting it. You have to realize that you are the conduit. And I've, I've grown into this area myself. I've, I've seen people, I've seen myself refraining 
you know, it's, it's, it's like out of good intention, you try to help them, you know, tell them what the Lord meant. Uh, no. <laughs> now, it could be that the word means something to you as well. You know, because the Lord is speaking to you. But what I've seen in my own ministry is when I have allowed them to just receive it without my commentary, the Lord has showed them things that I didn't see, that what, what, it, what he wanted to speak to them about. And, and it, adds to, it adds to the supernatural component to it. It's, it's really beautiful. Now, there seems to be a difference, though, between the office of prophet and the gift of prophecy. And here's where a lot of people make the mistake to say, well, there's a difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And let me tell you, that's not so. That's not the way to account for the difference. There is a difference. I'm not denying that there is a difference. I'm saying that there is a difference. But what I'm saying is that the difference is not based on a supposed difference between the Testaments. Because here's the thing. The whole thing is a Jewish book. The whole thing is, has one author. And, and what he's doing is bringing now a stronger foretaste of the world to come. So that's the progress that we see in how scripture is revealed. Not that it that one goes back and kind of cancels and contradicts or supersedes the other. Uh, for instance, in Jeremiah 1, we're familiar with Jeremiah's call. In Jeremiah 1 verse 10, it says, See, this is the Lord speaking, See, I have appointed you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and break down. Now, we've seen people try this in congregations. To destroy and to overthrow. And we've seen the destruction. <laughs> to build and to plant. You see, that is more, that last two pair is more like what Paul is saying. To edify, to exhort, and to comfort. To bring consolation. <clears throat> so there is a difference. And we need to hear the Lord so that we carry out this ministry not in a weird way, not interjecting ourselves into the story. It, it's almost like you are passing a message between lovers. You have no business inserting yourself into it, right? So, now the gift of prophecy is more to build and to plant for edification, for exhortation. The Spirit, through the gift of prophecy, the Spirit lovingly says, you are complete in Messiah. And we, we experience the peace, the shalom that comes from that. Now, the enemy, on the other hand, says, with a sense of urgency, you still lack. When you hear a message that, in essence, says, you still lack, Double check. Yeah. You know, the passage itself, down in the chapter, it says, let two or three prophesy, and the rest what? Judge. Mm -hmm. So judging the word is biblical. Yeah. So you're not being judgy. <laughs> you're not being judgmental. Right? It, it is possible to be judgy and judgmental. I, I'm not saying, but there is a place for judging the word. And we're, we'll talk a little bit, a little bit about that. Uh, so when, when a message comes from a person with a sense of urgency that in essence says you lack and it leaves you empty, you understand either this person did not hear from the Lord or they interpreted what the Lord was saying to them. 
and you have the prerogative to say thanks and not receive it. <laughs> okay, so if this is so messy and has the potential for being so messy, why do we need this? Well, we need it precisely because the gift of prophecy edifies. Yes. What does that mean, though? Well, you see, <clears throat> prophecy edifies through a word of knowledge. Through a word of knowledge. You see, a word of knowledge reveals to, to us the nature of a thing. So let's say you're considering a problem, a struggle, uh, a, a, a situation, family situation, work, relationships, uh, where you need discernment and you need to understand what is going on. You need a word of knowledge. A word of knowledge reveals the nature of the struggle, the situation, the problem, the circumstances, whatever. We need this. Uh, through the prophetic uh, ministry, you also receive words of wisdom, which is the other side of that coin of the, now that you understand the nature of the problem, now you need the best course of action. That's a word of wisdom. For you to decide whether you need to, st it could be that you need to step out of faith, uh, out in faith, I'm sorry, um, or that you need to realize in, in a, understanding a supernatural way to act in, in this situation. So we really cannot go through this life that we're called to without the prophetic gifting if we're going to live it in a supernatural way. A word also can be about your identity, and usually is about your identity, whether it's from God or from the enemy. You realize that. You see, God is going to always speak to you and say, you are. You are this. You are this to me. The enemy is also going to speak about to your identity. And he's going to say, you're not. That's right. Or, you'll never. That's right. You'll never be. Or, you're always... So we need to understand that words are about identity. Words are also about confirmation. This alone will save you a lot of headache. I had something happen not too long ago. Somebody said to me, I had a dream and, and the Lord was showing me that um, you, needed, you need to change the Torah study and make it be this time. Rather than preaching, that make this a time of Torah study. Well, when the Lord speaks to the, through the prophetic, it's usually for confirmation, which means he already has been speaking to you about it. And when the person comes to you, if it is from the Lord, you say, thank you, Lord. I knew somebody else told me about it, or I was. This is what I was thinking about. So it's this. It is as if the Lord reveals this person your conversation with Him, and you understand it only possible if it is of Him. It's supernatural. And so I was. I was able to decide very quickly with this person that uh, that really wasn't from the Lord for me. Now I didn't have to be nasty about it or immature about it, I just said, you know, that may be a word for you. The Lord has not been speaking to me about that. So I, I don't think there's a word for me, but it, it could be a word from you, for you. So maybe you need to go out and check it out. And they never came back. <laughs> Amazing how the Lord saves us from headaches, right? <laughs> Now, that leads me to the, the context in which we practice the prophetic. You see, the book of uh, 
First Corinthians, we're familiar with the arrangement for, because we have chapter 12, 13, and then 14. All about the spiritual gifts, all about the prophetic gift, but in the middle is the chapter of love. That is the context. We believe here in practicing the prophetic in love. So, um, so I'm going to read real quickly 1 Corinthians 13, the chapter of love, in this uh, section of the chapter that we know very well, that, right? Love is patient, love is kind. But in a context of practicing it in a prophetic ministry. So, the person who moves in the prophetic is patient. Now, think about that. Because in the prophetic, the prophetic doesn't... Uh, it, it happens, for the most part, in relationships, not with a mic in front of you. When your friend asks you for uh, counsel or help in understanding, when you speak to your children, frankly, you can move in the prophetic when you speak to your children. You better move in the prophetic when you speak to your children. <laughs> you, you want to parent out of a supernatural source. You don't want to do it out of your own source. You can move in the prophetic and you should move in the prophetic. Um, so we have a context of relationships when we practice the prophetic. So think about this. Think about this passage in that context now. So imagine that you are speaking to your teenage boys or girls. Now you understand that the person who moves in the prophetic needs patience. <laughs> now it makes sense. You see, this word for patience means to, to be long-suffering, to have a long fuse, not a short fuse. That's literally what it means. Macrothumia is the Greek word. Macro, big. And the word thumia, we get the word thermometer from that. So imagine a thermometer that is not so sensitive, right? A thermometer is going to be like, vroom, right immediately. I'm at 100 degrees, right? No, imagine that, you know, it's going slow. It takes a long time for this person to snap out at you. Love, the person who practices the prophetic in love, is kind. You know, I took this Greek word and I searched it in, in the Septuagint, which is, which is the Hebrew Bible in Greek. And it shows that for the most part, this Greek word translates the word good. The word tov. In, in Hebrew. So what it actually says is love is good. And you and I have talked about the meaning of the word good. You see, good, as we see it in Genesis, Genesis 1, right? God saw that it was good. God saw that it was very good. Good is that which is beneficial to make someone fruitful. Love makes you fruitful. Practicing the prophetic in love makes a person fruitful. Uh, it says that love is not jealous. There is a difference between jealousy and envy, and we confuse the two. Envy is when I want what you, what you have. Jealousy is when I hoard what I have. Now, there is a good jealousy. Right? I have a wife, you get your own. <laughs> right? That's good. But, but, I can't, I can't say, I have my money, you get your own. I can't do that. <laughs> so, 
So love is, does not act that way. So when I, when I move in the prophetic out of love, I'm going to give it away. I'm going to give it away. Now, it doesn't mean that I'm going to be unwise and just, now I'm going to give prophetic words to everybody and their brothers. But I don't hoard it. I, I give it away. It says, love does not brag. That's praising yourself. Right? I'm going to give you a prophetic word that really is all about me. Right? And how wonderful I, I, I am. Or it's not arrogant. You know, it's amazing. This, this word actually means to be, to, to get irritated. We've seen and we've heard of prophetic, prophetic words and prophetic ministry from people who sound kind of angry. <laughs> sound irritated. It's like, where's that coming from? <laughs> Verse 5, it says, The love does not act unbecomingly, which means dishonorably. Uh, translating into, uh, love, uh, uh, love is not going to shame the other person. And it is not going to disrespect. Uh, it does not seek its own. You know, this word for seek is the same word that Yeshua used when he said, seek first the kingdom. So imagine if instead of seeking the supernatural, the kingdom over your life, I'm actually seeking something for myself. Love is not provoked. It, it, it does not enter into arguments quickly. It, it's not argumentative. It, it, it doesn't get upset so that it starts arguing. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. I think of Joseph here. It doesn't mean that you didn't suffer a wrong. That what they did to you, what was done to you was right. It doesn't mean that. But it means that it doesn't take it into account. What does that mean? Well, this is the same phrase where it says uh, in Romans 6, consider yourselves dead to sin. It's the same Greek word. So here is the opposite. It's, I, I'm not going to consider myself offended. That's exactly what Joseph did. He said to them, yeah, you, what you did was real. And it actually hurt. But you know what? I'm no longer offended. I'm not a victim. I'm not acting towards you out of that source. Verse 7, we jump into verse 7. Uh, it bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Imagine somebody ministering to you in the prophetic that does not believe. It, it doesn't mean that I believe anything that you tell me. No, what it means is that you have faith in every circumstances, in every circumstance. So this person is not going to run out of faith and say, yeah, I kind of agree with you. I, I don't think you're ever going to get this, you know. <laughs> what kind of a help is that, right? <laughs> or a person who does not bear all things. What does that mean? Well, it's a person who, uh, to bear all things means to, to pass over in silence. What does that mean? Well, is looking at what I don't like, what I may not like, and I don't make an issue out of it. So I go into the line when we serve lunch and, you know, I may see something that I don't like. Maybe they're doing things a different way that I would do it. But you know what? I bear all things. So I'm not going to give them a prophetic word. Uh huh. Right? Out of me not bearing all things. You see that? They're practical. 
I want to finish. I know we're past our time, but I want to finish with this. That God trusts us as conduits. Using our personality in prophetic ministry. It's not out of context. He doesn't need to erase who I am in order to use me. There's a risk with that though. And it is that our wounds may leak into the message that we give somebody. Amen. We've, we have to walk that balance. Yes, the Lord uses me. For instance, I may give you a word out of the book of Leviticus. Because I'm the Leviticus nerd, right? He's going to use me who I am. Right? He's going to use you who you are. But he's taking the risk. You know, the prophetic is not different than the gift of teaching. The gift of teaching needs training. It needs improvement. It needs maturity. It needs practice. You grow into your gift of teaching. Well, it's the same with the prophetic. You have room to grow and to correct and to improve it and to get training and it all works that way. That is why at Sukkot we practice the prophetic based on freedom. You see, we invest in you being healthy, in you being healed, so that when you give prophetic words, the amount of the potential leaking of your wounds is greatly reduced. Greatly reduced. That's why it is such a huge priority for me to not lead this congregation out of fears. Yes. I work really hard at that. Me, bro. To not make decisions out of fear. Do not allow my woundedness to guide me in how I guide you. Me, we have to pursue. This is uh, our staff. Each one has a, a job description. But at the very top, the number one job of every person on staff at Sukkot Shalom is to pursue their own personal freedom. That's number one. So that when they are out here and they have a mic in front of them, brokenness and fears are not leaking into you. And you get a message that is clear and that has no side effects. <laughs> Amen. Amen. This is a huge core value for us. And this is a huge ministry. Because we do this all the time. When we greet each other, you are doing prophetic ministry. You're speaking words of encouragement. You're speaking words of edification. Mm -hmm. When we call each other and even text each other and contact each other on Facebook, whatever we do, we, we have a platform into each other's lives to speak from the Lord. So we do this all the time. And so it is imperative that we do it in love, out of freedom, for edification, and with all, all that, that we've spoken of today. Let's pray.